Hello and thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring these stories near and far. I'm Train Balinoso at Channels Television here in Lagos. I'm joined by Vincent McCory from Voice of America in Washington. Well, thanks. I'm Vincent McCory at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Chamberlain also in Lagos brings you that story. After 120 years of illegal transportation out of Nigeria, the Benin bronze will be back to Nigeria and sitting right where it belongs. This follows a memorandum of understanding on the transfer of ownership of the bronzes from Germany to Nigeria, which has been signed by Germany's Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, Minister of State for Culture Claudia Roth, and their Nigerian counterparts Lai Mohammed and Zuberu Dada. The historic Benin bronze, the head of a king, will soon be finally returning home to Nigeria, more than 120 years after it was stolen by colonial forces. The sculpture, which once adorned an altar, was one of more than 5,000 objects looted from the royal palace by the British army after the invasion of the Kingdom of Benin in 1897. A German businessman bought the bronze in Lagos and eventually took it to Europe. This is a story of European colonialism. We should not forget that Germany played an active role in this chapter of history. Today, more than 120 years later, we state clearly, the head of a king belongs to the people of Nigeria. Currently, more than 1,000 pieces of what are considered some of Africa's greatest treasures are residing in German museums. All will be returned to Nigeria by the German government and German museums in what Nigeria's foreign minister Zuberu Dada said showed tremendous courage. The first two bronzes, one depicting the head of a king, the other showing a king and his four attendants taken back personally by Dada and culture minister La Mohammed, who were present at the ceremony. I am delighted to be part of this auspicious event, which in my opinion will go down as one of the most important days in the celebration of African cultural heritage as epitomized by this historic joint declaration that our two countries are about to sign. As a federal government and as a country, we acknowledge the horrific outrages committed under colonial rule. We acknowledge the murders and plundering. We acknowledge the racism and slavery. We acknowledge the injustice and trauma that have left scars that are still visible today. Ladies and gentlemen, we can change our blindness towards the past. So this day should not only open our eyes, it should also shine a light to, to illuminate our shared future. Germany's decision to carry out one of the largest ever repatriations of historic artifacts reflects a dawning awareness in Europe of the continuing political relevance of anger at the lasting legacy of colonial looting and violence. To tell us more is the Director General of the National Commission for Museum and Monuments, Professor Abba Tijani. He joins us from our studios in Abuja. Thank you for joining us on the program, Professor. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so could you go ahead and tell us, how did we get to this stage? Well, thank you very much. It's been a long way. Uh, as you may recall, Nigeria uh, attempted to get uh, our stolen artifacts uh, to be repatriated to Nigeria uh, uh, since uh, in the 70s when we were planning for the first Act 77, uh, we, where we wanted to use one of the Benin bronzes as the you know, symbol for first Act. 
and that attempt uh, did not yield to result. And since then, there has been stories and uh, many attempts have been made without any you know, uh, thing coming up. So, but today we are in an era that we, there is a lot of awareness, a lot of social media and more professionals uh, interacting with the international community, particularly on the Nigerian side. So we are able to engage with our partners and uh, we told them the need to really do the right thing. And uh, that actually, the process uh, yielded uh, results. And uh, many countries now succumb to this, uh, our, you know, pressure and uh, decided to now engage with us to repatriate uh, the Benin bronzes in their holdings. Now, how soon do we expect these items since the MOU has been signed? Well, in reference to the signing of the uh, transfer agreement between Nigeria and Germany on the 1st of July, uh, we are looking at 1,130 Benin bronzes in different uh, museums uh, across Germany. And uh, with this signing now, the Benin bronzes can now come back to Nigeria at our own you know, pace and our own arrangement. So we are looking at this uh, 2022 for the Benin bronzes to start coming to Nigeria. And uh, we are also making efforts here in Nigeria to see that we provide the conducive environment for these objects to, uh, to, to be received and uh, properly stored and displayed for the Nigerian public and uh, tourists coming from outside. Now, that, that's quite a number. What preparations are in place to house them when they return? Well, as you may probably know, we have been having challenges of uh, the conditions of our museums across the country. Uh, but when I came in, I started uh, making you know, massive rehabilitation of our museums and galleries across the country so that they are worthy of uh, you know, having such kind of objects uh, you know, on display. Uh, we have done eight last year and we are doing nine this year. And uh, in addition to that also, we are planning, because the federal government is making effort to see that we have a new storage facility uh, at the premises of the National Museum uh, Benin. And uh, this is going to come up very soon and uh, will be completed where some of these objects can be stored and uh, displayed as well. But also we are engaging in... Uh, making arrangements for some of the objects to go on, uh, you know, international uh, traveling exhibitions. Uh, and that will also uh, attract some revenues to Nigeria. And uh, we thought that uh, there are many countries that have been hearing about Benin bronzes, but have not been able to see uh, these uh, objects. So we thought that it is the right time for us to also avail, you know, the international community to see our artifacts, to see the genius of our you know, ancestors' uh, work and skills, but also these objects to serve as ambassadors of Nigeria outside the country. Where, where else or where next should we expect any stolen artifact from? Well, we've been traveling around, we've been making efforts, and we've been engaging with different uh, you know, museums and countries, and I'm happy to say that the, universe, the Glasgow City uh, Museum has already approved repatriation of uh, the artifacts in their possession. Uh, and uh, we've gone there you know, last month and uh, we have met with them. And also the National Museum of Scotland have also started to, you know, the process of repatriation. But also uh, the Honeyman Museum in the United Kingdom have a number of uh, Benin bronzes, over 50, and they have already started the process of repatriation, and the final approval is expected uh, this month. And the also University of Cambridge uh, Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology uh, is also uh, in the process of uh, reaching an agreement to repatriate the Benin bronzes in their collections. So as well, the Pitts Rivers in Oxford uh, and then in the United States, uh, the Smithsonian has already approved the repatriation of 29 
Benin bronzes in their holdings. And uh, we have the Rhodes Island has one collection uh, objects and also the National Gallery of Art in Washington has one Benin bronze, which they have approved for us to go and uh, sign the agreement uh, in October. So there are also other uh, countries that we have reached out to and they are ready to start the process of repatriation. All right, then, Professor Abbatijani, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. The UN's International Labour Organization has started reviving abandoned buildings in Zimbabwe, a move informal traders say is helping them earn a living. Columbus Mavunga reports from Zimbabwe's second biggest city, Bulawayo, where the labor agency says Southern Africa must start reviving informal trading. Tinagumo is one of the thousands of Zimbabweans the UN International Labour Organization says it is helping by setting up safe workplaces. He lost his job at a diamond company about 10 years ago. To make ends meet, he set up a workplace in the open here in Zimbabwe's industrial hub of Blauayo, an area the labour agency has worked to revive. It's actually better here because the, the place is closed up, unlike where we were before, it was on an open space. You could not work when it's raining, even the heat conditions there, it could be difficult. But here it's quite comfortable. The ILO says it is targeting youths and about 100 entrepreneurs working in the informal sector. What we want to do, especially in the informal economy, is to promote the formalization of the informal economy. When you talk about the informalization of the informal economy, it comes with different facets. Number one, there is improvement of workspaces. Like, for example, this one you have just seen at Blower SME Centre, where we want to address uh, decent work deficits. Depending on who is speaking, unemployment figures vary from 30% to 95%. Zimbabwe authorities say the program will boost the country's economy by bringing in more people who pay taxes. The, the engagement that we are doing as a city with the, with the informal sector is for them to, to appreciate uh, the need for registration so that, so that they are counted in the, uh, in the GDP of the, the country overall. With many informal workers not paying taxes, by setting up formal structures, advocates say more people can contribute to the nation's economy and have a safer place to work and earn a living for themselves. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News, Bulawayo, Zimbabwe. Some photographers, journalists and researchers from countries surrounding the Nile Basin are taking up telling the stories of Nile and those living around it. They say it will not be proper to leave the task of telling their own story to strangers who may not represent them well. Some of the reports is showcased in an exhibition tagged the Everyday Nile Initiative. Twisting and curving through 11 countries, the Nile River holds a certain significance for each community it touches. For some, it's a practical source of water for crops, for others, a relaxing escape from the day's hustle and bustle. The Everyday Nile exhibit held in Cairo aims to give African journalists an opportunity to showcase what the river means to them and their communities. More than 10 reporters and photojournalists worked for three years documenting and telling the stories of those living on the banks of the Nile. The stories of my family are always connected to being close to the Nile. Here in Cairo, we're deprived from the Nile. We always see the Nile from a distance, and we have no direct relation with the Nile other than drinking from it. But my family there in Upper Egypt could view the Nile and be close to it, to move around it. For them, this was their trip and their leisure. The project, which includes stories from Egypt, Sudan, Kenya and Ethiopia, also offer key information and figures about the Nile. It enables us to have a voice 
for the night uh, to be able to, uh, to tell you the stories that need to be taken into consideration and, and be used in, uh, in making decisions. And the project made broke the boundaries that we have, geographical boundaries, because uh, all of us are coming from different countries, which are they have different jurisdictions and different parts of the nine. But when we did the nine story, we were all members of the nine. This initiative comes at a time of tension surrounding the now water shared among Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia over the operation of Ethiopia's Grand Renaissance Dam. It also coincides with rising debate over climate change and pollution challenges surrounding the Nile. For Everyday Now, Artistic Director Roger Anis, the challenging times means bigger responsibility to raise awareness of personal responsibility and community sharing towards common risks. In the struggle to reduce climate change emissions, hydroelectric power has the potential to fill some of the space currently occupied by oil and gas. In Cameroon, a giant hydroelectric project in Nichtal could increase the country's energy production by about 30 percent. Emmanuel Jules Ntap visited the site and filed this report, narrated by Karu Gunsberg. Just 60 percent of Cameroonians have access to electricity, according to the International Finance Corporation, or IFC. But Cameroon is hoping that this giant hydroelectric dam will change all that. When it is completed, the Nashtigal Dam should provide 420 megawatts of power for the country. We have a satisfactory level of progress with a completion rate of around 60%. The work includes seven machines which should go into production no later than the end of 2024, with the first machine which should, in principle, go into production in December 2023. Households in at least seven out of Cameroon's ten regions will receive energy from the Nashtagal Dam. It's a massive project employing nearly 1,500 workers. At the level of the main dam upstream, on a dam which is 1,450 meters long, from left bank to right bank, we have now reached out about 1,000 meters. The canal, which is 3,300 meters long, all in butime concrete, it is watertight. It is a unique project in Central Africa. Once the units and turbines are installed, the commissioning tests are scheduled for June 2023, and tests on the dam's strength will begin in 2024. Cameroon and national and international banks are shareholders in the project. The European Investment Bank, a pioneer in the financing of renewable energies in the world, injected 50 million euros into the dam's construction. This project in Nachtigal will provide uh, 6 million people, Cameroonians, with renewable energy for decades to come. And that, I think, is, uh, is very, very important. As the European Union's Climate Bank, we are happy to be partners with Cameroonian authorities in this important project. The project also received financial support from the European Union as part of its green energy initiatives. It is really nice to see how you exploit this natural resource which will give you a competitive advantage in the sub-region and on the continent. And there's more hydroelectric energy potential in Cameroon. The IFC estimates the country has the third largest hydropower potential on the continent. For Emmanuel Jules Ntap in Nashtigal, Cameroon, Carol Gunsberg, VOA News. In an incredible world of art, what appears to be impossible is making jaws drop as a young artist draws with his hands and feet simultaneously. Using four markers to simultaneously sketch different artwork with his hands and feet, or markers taped on all his ten fingers, Ahmed Mahmoud has devoted himself to art and its many forms. 
The 27-year-old artist, who started developing his skills since he was young, says he's had to overcome the lack of interest in art in his war-torn country. I started drawing since I was a little kid. There were cartoons and animation that I used to watch and I was attracted by the design, so I was trying to copy those drawings. Although sometimes there are shortage of art materials and tools, Mark would also showcase his talents by drawing morals of famous soccer players on the walls of a city stadium. While some believe he's a master at his craft, the young artist himself believes there's room for self-development. I like to have new challenges and new things to try, and I'm still learning, trying to improve myself. It was difficult to improve myself in a faster way. There was no logistics support provided. The young artist says he dreams of establishing a new form of art or a new style of drawing other than what people are used to. More sanitary pads available for African women and girls are relatively expensive and classified as single-use plastics which means some take hundreds of years to decompose. To help tackle this environmental problem, a woman-led Kenyan enterprise has created a low-cost biodegradable pad made from agricultural waste. Juma Majanga reports from Thika, Kenya. From a distance, you might think that Mary Nyarwai is simply disposing of agricultural waste at her home in Thika on the outskirts of Nairobi. But what she is actually doing is making biodegradable sanitary pads. After facing difficulties finding safe quality pads herself, Nyarwai thought of a solution using readily available raw materials. Maize is a staple in Africa and this, this is waste. So I, I normally go and collect it from the market and this is also waste. These leaves, pineapple leaves are waste, so I also collect them from the farms. So when you combine that two, you make a very beautiful pad that is soft and also absorbs, it gives, delivers on comfort and also absorption and it's also sustainable. Once collected, these agricultural waste undergo rigorous processes to break down the natural fibers and mold the raw materials into biodegradable sanitary pads. Nyarwai's company is called Nyongu Africa, loosely translated to Womb of Africa. Her pads are getting good reviews. The difference was quite significant. It felt like I was sitting on clouds because the material is very different. Her pads are very soft. The absorbency is good. It becomes really quite a lifesaver for yourself. In 2019, there was a widespread outcry on Kenyan social media questioning the quality of some pads on the market. Kenya's health ministry says it is attempting to maintain quality standards for the sanitary pads produced and sold in Kenya to protect consumers as well as the environment. The strategy uh, was broadly uh, uh, looking at uh, sanitation being a, a person-friendly issue. Now, the bigger thing or the new thing in that uh, strategy is that um, we were looking at uh, empowering uh, the individuals to be able to act. Nyarwai hopes her innovation can help Kenyan women not only with their health, but also with their financial well-being. Period poverty is a global crisis, but because Africa has a very large population of women who are marginalized and underserved, this is where period poverty really eats our women. This is a very, it's a makeshift small industry. So it, it is possible to be replicated in very many areas, just to train the women how to, you know, um, pick the right raw materials and process them and then to make the pads. And best of all, the pads are not made of plastic, which means they do no harm to the environment. Juma Majanga for VUA News, Thika, Kenya. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. 
Channels Television has our last word from Lagos. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Remember, ChannelCV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Chamberlain Nassau. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.